Uh, the anabolic steroids, often abbreviated as simply steroids, are a family of hormones that comprises testosterone, which is nature's own anabolic steroid, so to speak, the original natural anabolic steroid, together with dozens and dozens of synthetic derivatives of testosterone that have been synthesized over the last 70 years. And they include, for example, uh, nandrolone, decadurabolin, methenolone, which we call anadrol, you call them NAPs here, uh, methandienone, which uh, is called D-ball or Dianabol, both in America and in the UK, stanozol, winstrol, or winnies, uh, and numerous other synthetic derivatives. These drugs have a history going back about 70 years. In the late 1930s, testosterone was first isolated by chemists in Nazi Germany. And very soon after the discovery of testosterone, many synthetic variations on the testosterone molecule were quickly created. And it is even rumored that Hitler gave anabolic steroids to his SS officers um, in order to make them more aggressive, although not a piece of paper actually survives to validate whether that's true or not. Not long after the war, by the early 1950s, athletes had begun to discover that these drugs could produce dramatic improvements in muscle strength and athletic performance. And in 1954 was the first point where the Russians got busted for using steroids at the weightlifting championships in Vienna. And from the 1950s onward, steroids rapidly spread throughout the elite athletic world at the Olympic level and throughout the elite levels of bodybuilding and got to the point where routine testing for steroids had been inaugurated by the Montreal Olympics in the 60s. But it was not until about 1980 that steroids actually began to percolate out of the athletic world and onto the street, so to speak, to the point where ordinary rank and file men and boys were beginning to use these drugs in local gymnasiums. And that transition took place in America in the early 1980s and here probably closer to 1990. And then in the subsequent last couple of decades, steroid use has become widespread um, in Western countries. It's perhaps most pronounced in Scandinavia, interestingly enough, with, uh, British with the UK and other British Commonwealth countries and the United States sort of in the second rank, so to speak, possibly also with Brazil, then most other Western Europe, European countries and Latin American countries maybe in the third rank. And then with very, very little anabolic steroid use in the Far East, the steroid use is extremely rare um, in Gen's country of Japan or in Korea or in China. And the reasons for these differences between East and West are something that I will discuss uh, a little bit later in, in the course of this lecture. But the, the bottom line is that at this point now, in 2012, the great majority of steroid users are just ordinary men. The, the elite athletes are only a tiny fraction of the total number of steroid users, and the vast majority are just ordinary men um, in gyms throughout uh, the Western world. So why would people want to use this stuff? Well, there, there's basically three um, factors that I think collectively contribute to it. The first is that steroids are highly effective as I will show you momentarily. The second is that our Western cultural background um, supports uh, muscularity, rewards muscularity, and, and uh, equates muscularity with masculinity. And th this is a feature that also contributes to steroid use in Western countries. And then finally, as with any situation, uh, one has to have a population of individuals who are sort of at one extreme of the distribution namely individuals who have particular concern about their body image and their muscularity, as I will illustrate to you shortly. So first, steroids are dramatically effective. The medical community made a fool of itself for decades by claiming that steroids were not effective. And athletes knew perfectly well that the drugs were highly effective. And it was really not until the 1980s that the medical community begrudgingly conceded that they were wrong. But here, just to give you an idea, is Steve Reeves in the year of my birth, 1947, at the time that he won the Mr. America contest. This was the most muscular man in the world in 1947. 
Um, if you see, and this was a man who we know almost certainly had not used steroids because they didn't, uh, they were virtually unavailable at that point. Any man who is as lean as this man, but who is more muscular than this man and claims that he got that way naturally is probably lying. Here, here by comparison, is a modern two-bit body player who, bodybuilder who couldn't even win the Mr. America contest now. He has 30 or 40 more kilograms of muscle than Steve Reeves, and it's all attributable to chemicals. Here's another example. Again, notice particularly the dramatic size of the trapezius muscles on the back of his neck. Steroids tend to selectively increase the muscle mass of the upper body more than the lower body, and it creates this slightly unnatural uh, appearance with, with exaggerated musculature on the top. Same thing here, as you notice, that this guy's trapezii are not quite, as, not quite as dramatic. But now take a look by comparison at Steve Reeves. He has a completely normal neck. There's no massive trapezius muscle for him by comparison. So steroids not only allow you to gain huge amounts of muscle, but it, it tends to be particularly great in the upper body, which is very useful, for example, for hitting home runs in American baseball. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the steroids have become quite a scandal in American baseball, as some of you probably know. Here, going backwards in time again, here is Mr. America 1939. Mr. America 1939 would be lucky to take sixth place in the Mr. Essex County backup competition nowadays. <laughs> um, or Mr. America 1953, uh, 1956, sorry. Perfectly, perfectly respectable, but a pale shadow of what could be achieved with anabolic steroids by a modern steroid using bodybuilder, where if you take enough steroids, you can have a back that will look like a manta ray. Um, so, the bottom line is, this, steroids are highly effective. There's just no point in denying it. Um, kids know this, uh, and uh, there is no question that the drugs work extremely well. But, oh, and just also for loss of body fat, I threw this slide in because it shows that you can reduce body fat to extremely low levels. The reason that men have more muscle and less fat than women is that men have high levels of testosterone and men have very, women have very low levels of testosterone. So if you take additional testosterone, you become more male than male, effectively, with, the, with, unusual, with exceptional leanness and exaggeration of the upper body musculature. But the effectiveness of steroids alone is not enough to trigger um, widespread use. You also need a cultural background that rewards and encourages muscularity. And our um, encouragement of muscularity or support of muscularity, so to speak, has been in the West, has become particularly pronounced, this emphasis on muscularity has become particularly pronounced over the last several decades. And one example of this is the evolution of what we call action toys. This is um, our favorite American action toy, G.I. Joe. His equivalent here is called Action Man. And as you can see, when G.I. Joe first appeared in 1964, he was a perfectly ordinary looking dude. If he were my height, he would have a normal chest, normal biceps and deltoids. But you can see that by 1995, G.I. Joe has started to put in a bit of time at the gym and has got, uh, gained a certain amount of biceps mass and even a few abdominal muscles. And by 1992, he's not only put in quite a bit of time at the gym, but perhaps has done a cycle or two uh, and now has 16 and a half inch biceps and a full six pack of abdominal muscles, uh, far removed from his 1964 counterpart. And this <coughs> evolution is even more dramatic with the miniature GI Joes that first appeared in America on the American market in 1982. <laughs> so on the left is the 1982 GI Joe grunt, who as you can see is a perfectly ordinary looking little infantryman. Then in 1991, his counterpart has become decidedly larger and more muscular. And then by 1997, we have the G.I. Joe Extreme, <laughs> whose biceps are almost as big as his waist and has a scowl on his face to go with it. Um, and this same evolution has been present in many other action toys as well. Uh, for example, if we look at the, the Star Wars figures and look at Luke Skywalker, <laughs> 
When Luke first uh, appeared at the time of the original Star Wars release in 1997, he was uh, 1977. He was a perfectly ordinary looking guy. But when Star Wars was re-released 20 years later, Luke had become dramatically more muscular. And the story is told that Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, upon picking up the 1997 rendition of himself is said to have exclaimed, good God, they put me on steroids. <laughs> and the same, the same evolution has occurred, for example, for Han Solo, who once again goes from a very ordinary looking guy to a far more muscular counterpart. And again, it, I'm, I'll pass these around as long as you're careful not to lose them. Uh, <laughs> just, just send them, work their way up to the top and just make sure that they don't disappear. <laughs> um, and not only do we grow up seeing muscle in action figures, but we see muscle everywhere in Western culture. Uh, consider, for example, just ordinary advertisements in a magazine. Um, who would think of using muscle to advertise coffee liqueur, or muscle to advertise cellular telephones, or muscle to advertise ironing boards? <laughs> but we in the West are, are accustomed to this. We, we see images of muscularity everywhere when we go about our day in, in advertisements, in television dramas, in Hollywood movies, in cartoons, um, so that it is something that's quite integral to our culture. We grow up uh, you know, with this uh, culture that, that uh, gives a positive value on muscularity. And steroids, as a result, are not viewed in quite the same way as other drugs. For example, flying over on the airplane in the seat back pocket in the magazine, there's an ad for negotiating seminars where you can learn to do good business negotiating. And the people who do these seminars are saying that it's like steroids for your career. But they probably would be less successful if they said it's like marijuana for your career, or <laughs> like heroin for your career, um, or giant post-it notes you know, being advertised as, think of it as a post-it note on steroids. Again, less likely to be successful if it were advertised as a post-it note on cocaine. Uh, so there's a definite sort of positive spin on steroids because of this Western, very uh, powerful Western tradition of muscularity. And I would submit that this tradition of muscularity is not merely just in the last 30 or 40 years of G.I. Joe, but goes back for 2,000 years. Here, for example, is, is the Farnese statue of Heracles, presently in the Archaeological Museum in Naples, in Italy. Um, and the Italian anatomist, Bernardino Genga, in the late 17th century, created an anatomy textbook. And he went down to Naples and made a drawing of the Farnese Heracles. Um, and th this drawing is now in, in the National Medical Library in, in the United States. And it is striking that Genga, doing a drawing 250 years before anabolic steroids were discovered, has, descri has depicted a body that looks eerily like a Mr. Universe contender today. And then you'll remember that I had mentioned in passing earlier that the Scandinavians have perhaps the greatest amount of steroid use of any country in the world. And one reason for that, I would suggest, is that Scandinavia has even more of a tradition of muscularity than we have, with the tradition of the Norse gods and Thor and Vulcan and the Vikings. And as an example of that, here is uh, Fusli's painting of uh, Thor battering the Midgard serpent. This is from the 13th century prose Edda. This painting is down in London, as a matter of fact. And again, firstly, painting 150 years before testosterone was discovered has created a Thor that looks remarkably like a modern Mr. Universe contender. And take a look at his boatman, Hymir, who is asleep in the bow of the boat. Hymir is even bigger than Thor himself. But by contrast, you'll remember that I remarked that in the Far East, in, in Japan or China, that steroid use is extremely rare. And part of that may be because the Far East does not have a tradition of muscularity like ours. Uh, there is no equivalent of a Farnese Hercules statue in, in Eastern tradition. Here, for example, uh, this is from Gen's native country, are the, are the gods Izanagi and Izanami, who drew the island of Japan up out of the waves of the Pacific. This is a 
a drawing of this that's, that's in our Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, as a matter of fact. And as you can see, Izanagi is a perfectly ordinary looking man with fully clothed, no additional muscle, nothing comparable to uh, Thor or to Hercules. And then here's another example. This is a uh, statue, one of the oldest wooden statues in the world, actually, from the Matsuo Shrine, about uh, 20 miles from Gen's house in Kyoto. And again, uh, this god is fully clothed, has no exaggerated musculature, nothing comparable to what we have in, in Western tradition. So I would suggest that the tradition of muscularity that we have had in the West for, for centuries, and, and which has been particularly accelerated, if you will, over the last few decades, um, is an integral factor in the widespread use of steroids among Western men. But still, there's a third component that is necessary. Um, and that is that you have to have some people who are particularly concerned with their body image. And this is a fact that I began to notice, particularly when I started doing research on steroids back in the 1980s. And I saw a number of men who had what they called bigorexia nervosa. Um, now, as many of you know, anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder primarily seen in young women where women will look at themselves in the mirror and see themselves as fat, even though they are actually very young or even very lean or even emaciated. And I encountered guys who showed exactly the reverse of this syndrome, uh, reverse anorexia nervosa, if you will, who perceived themselves to be continuously small and wimpy, even though they were actually large and muscular, and no amount of muscularity was enough to satisfy them. And Men who are at that end of the distribution, who are particularly concerned with body image and muscularity, are presumably the ones most likely to use anabolic steroids. And now to actually show you a little bit of scientific data, Gen and I did a study um, back in uh, about a decade ago, it was published in 2006, where we recruited um, 89 experienced weightlifters. Uh, men who could perform at least one repetition of a bench press with uh, 120 kilograms. And among these men, there were 41 who had never used steroids, 48 who had used steroids, who were in turn subdivided into 24 men who had used steroids only briefly for less than six months of total time in their lives, and 24 heavy users who had used steroids in many instances for years in their lives. And we then asked these three groups of men a series of questions. I said, well, first, have you ever been preoccupied that you were too small and needed to get bigger? Well, I can assure you, as somebody who's lifted you know, for the last 30 years, that that's almost ubiquitous if you lift weights regularly. Uh, so we had a large number of positive answers. But among the heavy users, virtually 100% answered yes to that question. So then we asked them a, a narrower question, which was, have you ever refused to take your shirt off in a public situation because you were afraid that you didn't look big enough? Only about 10% of the non-users had, had that degree of embarrassment, but almost half of the heavy users could recall instances where they had specifically avoided taking their shirt off <coughs> for fear that they were not big enough or muscular enough. And then we asked an even narrower question which is, have you ever given up some pleasurable activity or something that you would normally have wanted to do simply because you were afraid that you didn't look big enough? And only two of the 41 non-users answered yes. But almost a third of the users could recall instances where they had relinquished an opportunity to go to a swimming pool or to the beach or to do some activity that they would have liked to do, but they deliberately relinquished it because they were afraid that they did not look big enough. So, Preoccupation with body image is a common factor that may help, in, in, uh, together with these other factors, to predispose some individuals to use steroids. And we then followed up on that in a, a large study which we just published, it just came out in the journal Biological Psychiatry a few months ago. And we got a group this time of uh, about 230 men, of whom 102 had used steroids at some time, and about 130 had not and gave them a rating scale where we asked them about body image concerns or muscularity concerns when they were young teenagers between the age of 13 and 16. And 
as you can see, the blue, uh, the, the upper blue line are people who had relatively low, the lower 50% of preoccupation with body image. The red line is men who had higher Kaplan-Meier curves. The, the men with the higher preoccupation in red were much more likely as the years went by to develop anabolic steroid use. And uh, to, to the point where a large percentage of them had become users by the time they were 30. And the difference between these two curves, not surprisingly, is highly significant at, at well beyond the 0 .001 level, showing that, that concern with body image is, is a major predictive factor um, as to who will take steroids and who will be content to lift weights without taking them. So in summary, you have highly effective drugs. You have a, a cultural climate that supports and, and rewards muscularity. And then within that group, you have individuals who are particularly uh, focused on body image and muscularity. And those three factors collectively lead to steroid use, which has become quite widespread, as I have described, throughout most of Western countries. Mm -hmm.